Seal 1917 buoy is perhaps one of the most impressive buoys to ever come out of the catalog of Gold Steel and out of the innovative mind of Lynn Thompson. Before I proceed with the review of this fantastically designed production buoy, I think it is important for us to take note that Lynn Thompson isn't just some production knife maker. He is also a very dedicated martial artist whose lineage goes as far back as Guru Dani Nisanto. So he is Jeet Kune Do trained and Filipino martial arts trained. But in addition to that, he maintained communications with Bill Bagwell as it relates to buoy design. So Lim Thompson is very much one of the leading figures of the combat buoy knife the way we know it today. When we take a look at the Natchez, we take a look at the Laredo, all you have to do is take a look at the impressive lineup of buoy knives that he has had in his catalog on Cold Steel for many decades. Starting with the Trailmaster, going all the way up to the Laredo, the Natchez, and now the Gold Steel 1917. He is a very big proponent of taking a look at the knife primarily as a combative tool, but most of all, he is not afraid to go through the history books and cross-culturally to bring up other wonderful designs like the Cold Steel Falcon, the Cold Steel Arkansas Toothpick, and of course, the Espada XL. So, Lynn Thompson is someone that I have a lot of respect for, not only because of his contributions to the knife world, but because of his insistence that as tough and strong as his knives are, his knives have to be very combat ready. And a lot of that thought process really applies to this very wonderful Cold Steel 1917 buoy. It has all of the amazing classic designs that we really associate with buoys, specifically the Southwestern buoys. And when we take a look at it, there's a lot that we can see. Not only do we see a lot of those homages to the wonderful sheath that we have here that has this loop, the frog stud, but also the steel cap design that houses the sheath. There's a lot to be said about the homages that they made to that type of design. The other thing that I want to draw to your attention is the infamous S guard that were found in much later buoy designs. We have a wonderful fuller here to actually lighten it. There's a gun bluing to it, so it has this beautiful aesthetic to it. But of course, the overall size of the buoy is such that it is so intimidating. It is an absolute tactical and offensive deterrent. One of the important values of the S guard is your ability to go from an edge up orientation and be able to take your finger hook it across that back S guard and secure it when you're using the edge up orientation. So there's a lot of thought that went into the design of this knife. There's something else to consider here. When we see the hooking here on the butt end of the knife really allows it because this is a very heavy knife. So if I decide to snap cut and I decide that I want maybe a little bit more reach and I kind of want to mess around with it. If I decide to edge my hand down a little bit and now this portion of the handle sinks into my palm more it activates those mechanoreceptors along my tricep line which is important for force generation when I fire this you can only imagine in the hands of a very skillful buoy knife master where that person can transfer all of that mass and all of that speed through that snap cut. Although it is combat ready and although it is of a classical design, there are some things about it that make moving with it a bit of a pain. It is important that if you're going to get very good at buoy combatives, the one thing that you're gonna have to really think through is not necessarily how sharp it is or how historically accurate it is in terms of design. You wanna make sure that it has good balance and good weight distribution because if you're dedicated to the practice, you're going to be putting in 10,000 reps at least when you're moving with a buoy knife. A lot of the movements, specifically the back cut and the reverso, takes a lot of reps and hours to really perfect because you want to make sure that your neural sequencing is correct. For example, if I'm doing a buoy back cut with this knife, my neural sequencing has to be so precise because its weight distribution is not optimal 
in the first couple of two reps, I may be okay. But as time proceeds, you're going to start to feel some compensations in your shoulder and in your wrist. So probably around rep 20, rep 30, rep 40, you're going to start to feel it in parts of your body where you say, hey, that's starting to feel a little weird. I think I'm starting to feel some sort of aches and pains in my shoulders and joints. In order to be good at knife fighting and any sort of edge weaponry specific to the movement and flow of the techniques, it is important to put in a lot of time. So as much as this is a wonderful combat knife that I think will do the job and do double duty, this is not your optimal buoy knife, let alone your optimal buoy practice knife. Because of the mass of the blade, you're going to want to consider this as a buoy practice knife only later on, a little more intermediate and maybe even advanced because you're going to be able to understand the language of the buoy knife so that you're not using any sort of compensatory mechanisms. A good compensatory mechanism is to try to use the wrist to make the back cut happen. It is not a wrist movement, it is a shoulder movement. It is a shoulder movement that takes advantage of the oblique sling that goes from this shoulder to the contralateral hip. So technically, the back cut for this is a core-centric movement, as with most back cuts. Make sure you get your reps in with a knife that is a little more optimal for practice. One of them is, of course, I highly recommend the Cold Steel Laredo because it is very forgiving in terms of putting in your reps. You're going to need some good coaching just to make sure that you're firing it from the right neural sequence. The other one that I highly recommend, which is also relatively forgiving, is the Ontario Bagwell. This is very fast, gives enough feedback, but also at the same time, if you're putting in reps and you happen to fire it from the wrong neural sequence, it's going to be very forgiving. The Cold Steel 1917, you gotta make sure that everything is dialed in from your snap cut, your thrust, buoy, and reverso because there's several things that are going to be unforgiving other than the sheer mass of the knife. If we take a look at the handle design and how angular this is, if you're not careful and you start to do your buoy back cut with this specific handle, this is going to come in a little sharply on your palm. And sometimes in some of my back cuts, I don't necessarily get feedback from it, I get sensation instead. If you can imagine a bench press, if your hands are aligned along the barbell, but more importantly, angled in so that the barbell is right across your hand, you want it so that when you push right into it, if you're doing this correctly, with all the correct neural sequencing, and you push, you're not gonna feel it in your chest, you're not even gonna feel it in your shoulders and your arm. You're gonna feel your legs and feet lift that barbell off of you. That's a really good rep for a bench press. Same exact thing with the Bowie knife. If you have a really good handle that's ergonomically designed with a lot of intelligence, but also a really well weight distributed buoy and your technique is sound, when you fire that back cut, it's gonna feel like you just caught this beautiful wave in Hawaii and all of a sudden the wave is doing all the work for you and you're just chilling. You're just enjoying catching that wave. That's how it feels when you're moving with a really high level buoy knife. And of course with my custom bagwells, that's something that I feel, but it took quite a bit of practice to get there as well. So just be mindful that because of the handle ergonomics of this specific knife, from a practice standpoint, if you're putting in a lot of reps, two things ought to stand out. The weight distribution of the knife is such that it is very blade heavy. A lot of it has to do with trying to make this a full tang knife, which is really secure, but at the same time, trying to have it so that that weight transfers into the tip of the blade whether it's a snap cut, a thrust, or a back cut. Other main issue with regards to this is because of the angularity of that handle. So that when you back cut, sometimes you're not gonna feel feedback, you're gonna feel that sensation. If we go back to that bench press analogy, if your hands are not aligned correctly onto that bench press and you push, you don't feel your whole body pushing into it. It's gonna feel very localized. All of a sudden, that's when you're bench benching and you're going, oh man, I have crap shoulders or, Oh, I feel that in my neck. It has nothing to do, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with any existing orthopedic issues. A lot of times it's just an adjustment in technique and neural sequencing. 
And it's the same exact thing with the 1917. It requires a high level of kinesthetic awareness and neural sequencing so that when you fire that buoy back cut, you really feel it and it's working really well for you. So this is something that I'm going to move with just so that you can see what it's like to move with a heavy but very functional buoy knife. Now I may be asked, do I prefer it over the Natchez? Absolutely prefer it, simply because the handle itself doesn't have any of the types of characteristics that you see on the Natchez, which has all of those contours that, although has some historical basis, I think it's far more decorative than it is ergonomic. At least with this squared handle, your hand can fit into it enough and can contour around it enough so that any compensations that you can make, at least you're getting feedback, but most of all, you're not getting negative space. Meaning, as you're moving with it, all of a sudden there's space in your fingers even briefly. When you don't get that kind of signal from your hand, from the weapon, because of any sort of negative space, even for a microsecond, so it's for a second, it's kind of telling you, whoa, where did we go? What happened to the knife? Is it still there? At least with this Bowie knife, when I move with it, it fills my hand at all times. It doesn't give me that kind of feedback that transfers all the way into my thumb. In fact, I don't feel it in my thumb. I still feel it in my mechanoreceptor. The only problem that I'm seeing with this is because of that weight that tends to just sit right there, you have to be able to move the rest of your body in a way kinesthetically so that when I move, it can transfer into the strike. So I'm going to be moving with the Cold Steel 1917. Mind you, this is one of my favorites. I absolutely love this knife. However, I don't love it for practice. There are other better knives for that, which I mentioned, which happens to be the Ontario Bagwell and the Cold Steel Laredo for production buoys. I really hope you enjoyed this video and thank you for letting me share. A few important details before we go ahead with working with the 1917. First of all, make sure that your palm is flush against the angle of that handle that I had mentioned earlier. That way there is no negative space in your hand and it is flush against the mechanoreceptors of the tricep line. I normally like to have my left hand right next to my rib cage, but in order to offset the unique weight distribution of the 1917, I like to have it out to the left and nice and open. There's several important reasons also why I like to keep it here. So pay very close attention to this posture because we are going to come back to it. I'm going to imagine that I'm working with an imaginary plumb line that comes down my shirt and I'm going to be pivoting off of this with as minimal disturbance to my torso as possible. So I'm going to be pivoting my head and my waist around this line and the majority of that movement is gonna come from that right shoulder as it comes forward for the back cut and the left shoulder actually goes back. So the counterbalance between right and left shoulder as I pivot around that line is what's going to create this dynamic. So make sure that you keep this in mind when you move with the 1917. Keeping my left arm right next to me allows me to move with a lot of freedom with the 1917, especially when I'm doing back cuts. Really good also when I do some snap cuts with the 1917. That way you see how my left hand actually works as a very subtle counterbalance whenever I do movements where my right shoulder fires forward. The specific biomechanics relating to fluid shoulder dynamics as well as the lowered left arm working as a counterbalance to the 1917 works really well to optimize the 1917 for the conventional edge down Bowie knife orientation. However, I think it does shine in a more advanced orientation when we move it into the edge up with the index finger wrapped tightly around the S guard. This changes the biomechanics because now we are activating more from the tricep and the lat line to stabilize that right shoulder. The index finger now works as a secondary fulcrum that also pulls that bottom handle into the mechanoreceptors of the hand even further firing the tricep line and lat line so that you can now launch really powerful up slashes. Quick combinations with the back cut as well as very powerful thrusts to the torso. Because of the index finger being positioned where it is, it acts as a trigger to really take advantage of that edge up orientation. I think the 1917 really shines in this edge up orientation because of how the index finger takes advantage of its unique biomechanics as a secondary fulcrum. In that regard, I think it is good to reconsider what we can really do with it with a double cold steel 1917 buoy training setup. Remember this guy with the funny line coming down his shirt 
Remember his left hand. That left hand sets up the secondary Bowie knife. The first one with the edge down orientation and the second one with the edge up orientation with the left index finger securely holding that upward S guard. This I believe is what the 1917 Cold Steel is made for, double buoy knife fighting. With the left hand creating localized ocular distraction while setting up the left hand for all types of up slashes while the right hand throws vicious back cuts in the name of ungodly terror, this type of combination two 1917 buoys working together one in the edge down orientation while the other one works with the left hand orientation up slashing thrusting this type of combination is only for the advanced buoy knife practitioner especially with the kind of deadly weapon that is the cold steel 1917 buoy knife i really hope you enjoyed this video stick around stay tuned more videos to come